If one fictional figure can be said to have dominated the pop cult of the 80s, it was the cop. Fucking police everywhere you turned, worse than real life. What an incredible bore. Powerful cops protecting the meek and humble at the expense of a half dozen or so articles of the Bill of Rights. Dirty Harry. Nice human cops coping with human perversity, coming out sweet and sour, you know, gruff and knowing, but still soft inside. Hill Street Blues, most evil TV show ever. Wise-ass black cops scoring witty racist remarks against hick white cops who nevertheless come to love each other. Eddie Murphy, class traitor. For that masochist thrill, we got wicked, bent cops who threatened to topple our cozy consensus reality from within like Giger-designed tapeworms, but naturally get blown away just in the nick of time by the last honest cop, Robocop, ideal amalgam of prosthesis and sentimentality. We've been obsessed with cops since the beginning, but the rosers of yore played bumbling fools, keystone cops, car 54, where are you? Booby bobbies set up for Fatty Arbuckle or Buster Keaton to squash and deflate. But in the ideal drama of the 80s, the little man who once scattered blue bottles by the hundred with that anarchist's bomb innocently used to light a cigarette, the tramp, the victim with the sudden power of the pure heart, no longer has a place at the center of narrative. Once we were that hobo, that quasi-surrealist chaos hero who wins through Wu Wei over the ludicrous minions of a despised and irrelevant order. But now we are reduced to the status of victims without power or else criminals. We no longer occupy that central role, no longer the heroes of our own stories. We've been marginalized and replaced by the other, the cop. Thus, the cop show has only three characters, victim, criminal, and police person. But the first two fail to be fully human. Only the pig is real. Oddly enough, human society in the 80s, as seen in the other media, sometimes appeared to consist of the same three cliché archetypes. First, the victims, the whining minorities bitching about rights, and who, pray tell, did not belong to a minority in the 80s. Shit, even cops complained about their rights being abused. Then, the criminals, largely non-white, despite the obligatory and hallucinatory integration of the media, largely poor or else obscenely rich, hence even more alien, largely perverse, that is, the forbidden mirrors of our desires. I've heard that one out of four households in America is robbed every year, and that every year nearly half a million of us are arrested just for smoking pot. In the face of such statistics, even assuming they're damned lies, one wonders who is not either victim or criminal in our police state of consciousness. The fuzz must mediate for all of us, however fuzzy the interface. They're our only warrior priests, however profane. America's Most Wanted, the most successful TV game show of the 80s, opened up for all of us the role of amateur cop hitherto merely a media fantasy of middle-class resentment and revenge. Naturally, the true-life cop hates no one so much as the vigilante. Look what happens to poor and or non-white neighborhood self-protection groups, like the Muslims who tried to eliminate crack dealing in Brooklyn. The cops busted the Muslims. The pushers went free. Real vigilantes threaten the monopoly of enforcement, les majeste, more abominable than incest or murder. But mediated vigilantes function perfectly within the cop state. In fact, it would be more accurate to think of them as unpaid, not even a set of matched luggage, unpaid informers, telemetric snitches, electro stoolies, rat finks for a day. What is it that America most wants? Does this phrase refer to criminals or to crimes? to objects of desire in their real presence, unrepresented, unmediated, literally stolen and appropriated. America most wants to fuck off work, ditch the spouse, do drugs, because only drugs make you feel as good as the people in TV ads appear to be. 
have sex with nubile jailbait, sodomy, burglary? Hell yes. What unmediated pleasures are not illegal? Even outdoor barbecues violate smoke ordinances nowadays. The simplest enjoyments turn us against some law. Finally, pleasure becomes too stress-inducing and only TV remains. And the pleasure of revenge, vicarious betrayal, the sick thrill of the tattletale. America can't have what it most wants, so it has America's most wanted instead. A nation of schoolyard toadies sucking up to an elite of schoolyard bullies. Of course, the program still suffers from a few strange reality glitches. For example, the dramatized segments are enacted cinema verite style by actors. Some viewers are so stupid they believe they're seeing actual footage of real crimes. Hence, the actors are being continually harassed and even arrested, along with, or instead of, the real criminals whose mug shots are flashed after each little documentoid. How quaint, eh? No one really experiences anything. Everyone reduced to the status of ghosts. Media images break off and float away from any contact with actual everyday life. Phone sex, cyber sex, final transcendence of the body, cybernosis. The media cops, like televangelical forerunners, prepare us for the advent, final coming, or rapture of the police state. The wars on sex and drugs. Total control, totally leached of all content. A map with no coordinates in any known space. Far beyond mere spectacle. Sheer ecstasy standing outside the body. Obscene simulacrum. Meaningless, violent spasms elevated to the last principle of governance. Image of a country consumed by images of self-hatred. War between the schizoid halves of a split personality. Super ego versus the id kid for the heavyweight championship of an abandoned landscape. Burnt, polluted, empty, desolate, unreal. Just as the murder mystery is always an exercise in sadism, so the cop fiction always involves the contemplation of control. The image of the inspector or detective measures the image of our lack of autonomous substance, our transparency before the gaze of authority, our perversity, our helplessness. Whether we imagine them as good or evil, our obsessive invocation of the eidolons of the cops reveals the extent to which we have accepted the Manichaean worldview they symbolize. Millions of tiny cops swarm everywhere, like the clip-off, larval hungry ghosts. They fill the screen, as in Keaton's famous two-reeler, overwhelming the foreground, an Antarctic where nothing moves but hordes of sinister blue penguins. We propose an esoteric hermeneutical exegesis of the surrealist slogan, Mort au Vache. We take it to refer not to the deaths of individual cops, or cows in the argot of the period, mere leftist revenge fantasy, petty reverse sadism, but rather to the death of the image of the fleek, the inner control and its myriad reflections in the no place place of the media, the gray room, as Burroughs calls it. Self-censorship, fear of one's own desires, conscience as the interiorized voice of consensus authority. To assassinate these security forces would indeed release floods of libidinal energy, but not the violent running amok predicted by the theory of law and order. Nietzschean self-overcoming provides the principle of organization for the free spirit, as also for anarchist society, at least in theory. In the police state personality, libidinal energy is dammed and diverted towards self-repression. Any threat to control results in spasms of violence. In the free spirit personality, energy flows unimpeded and therefore turbulently but gently. Its chaos finds its strange attractor, allowing new spontaneous orders to emerge. In this sense, then, we call for a boycott of the image of the cop and a moratorium on its production in art, 
in this sense, Mork Ovash. <laughs>